calling all green-fingered gurus and plant killers alike. We got you covered every month with gardening inspiration, hands-on practical advice and fun projects to do. From the latest in plant fashion, growing your own, whether to prune or not to prune, from cover to cover, the Gardener and Detainee magazines have got your back. Get your copy now or subscribe online at thegardener.co.za. Gardening with Tanya is proudly brought to you by Gardena. Realize your gardening dreams. Effecto. Target pesky garden pests. And TanyaFisser.com for all your gardening goodies and supplies. Good morning everybody. It is Thursday and do you notice something? Yeah, I noticed it this morning. We had a move set. So Wafa, Wifi, she fell over. She fell over in the beautiful valley that we live in. It wasn't only us, it was the entire valley. Boy, do you want to see upset people on one of those WhatsApp groups? I'm sure you have. Do you have those WhatsApp groups? You know, and somebody, you join so many and they don't send a message to the wrong group. Have I done that? <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> anyway, so Wifi, she fell over. So early this morning, um, we had the car, we packed the car, we had to bring all our beauties um, to our, our new studio. Thank goodness we have another spot that we can go to. We're slightly down the hill um, from the Howa area, from Asagar, and we're in Westville this morning coming to you live. I always wanted to say that. Yes, yes, yes. Um, guys, I see a lot of you are online already. I just hope I haven't forgotten anything. It's like, you know, when you're in your space, it's like when I'm at home, that it's my garden. I've, I've got everything and I just shout and someone throws something at me and I get it, what I want, because kind of that's how I roll. But anyway, so um, today we're talking about unhappy houseplants. Oh, oh, come on. How many have you killed? How many? One, two, three, four. If you start going onto the second hand and onto your toes, you're in trouble. But best of all, you're in the right spot. Um, and guys, it, it really is simple and we're dumbing it down today. We, we're not talking highfalutin, we're not talking fancy. This is going to be the basics. It's the way that I have approached houseplants all my life. Um, you know, my mom had houseplants. Of course, it was the anthurium. There were one or two Cattleya orchids. There was always a fern. Remember, remember, our, our grannies and our moms always had those ferns with the um, very, very fine foliage. Um, they were beautiful. Normally on the stoop, um, on one of those metal racks. In fact, I've still got my Granny Jill's metal rack, which is painted Windsor Green. Yes, no other colour, but Windsor Green. And um, the plants were stacked there, and they were, they were, that was their spot. But nowadays, we want plants all over. And why? Because you can because you can. Um, so guys, that's what's important, is that we can put houseplants anyway. Um, our one bathroom looks like a jungle, true story, jungle. In fact, there's even a frog that lives in that bathroom. I'm really scared of frogs. I'm really, really scared of frogs. So I like, I walk in and I look, is the coast clear? And then I leave. Uh, but, but you know, yeah, talk about wildlife in the house, uh, which the dogs think is just playtime for them. In fact, I think they think that it, the frog was put there for them, but never mind, we're not going to go there. Um, but you know, th the world has changed, guys, and, and we all know that. And plants have become more and more and more part of our life. Um, we were listening to a podcast just the other day on tests that were done on house plants with electrodes, with of course a nice gel in between so it didn't hurt them. 
and how the plants reacted to stimulus, how they reacted to voice, how they reacted to pain, how they knew, they knew that the mood of the owner of the house plant was down all through the electric current that runs through the house plant. You might think I am completely cuckoo and like a little bit like out there that I have my medication this morning. It is 100% true. Um, guys, we've all read books and read podcasts um, and things about the Celestine prophecy. The, uh, what was the other one? Uh, chicken soup for the soul. What was the other one? Um, come on, the secret, the seven secrets. What was it? Seven secrets or something. Anyway, you, you know what I'm talking about. Those ones. We've all read those about what we give is what we get. What we put out comes back. The negativity flows and it's got to go somewhere because it's energy. And where does it go? Well, I hate to tell you, it's like a boomerang, baby. You throw that thing and it goes... Sometimes it takes a bit longer to get back to you, but when it gets you, it claps you. <laughs> Boom. Okay. So what does that mean? Our attitude determines our altitude. Our attitude determines the altitude of our plants, of the people around us, of those that we mix with, and those who will give you a smile voluntarily. And so to your plants. Guys, I know that you're going to have lots of questions today, but I'm going to keep it really, really simple. So let me see who's online before we get into the dying plants. Right, so uh, Bernice Jacobs is here. Fully agree. Plants can feel. Yes, they do. They do. I mean, it, it is insane, the tests that have been done um, and, and all the experimentation. And a lot of it was done in the 60s and 70s. Um, NASA has done a whole lot of tests. Um, and so if you, want, if you want to spark your mind and, and just start reading about like the woo-woo stuff out there, come on, go for it. Um, Fawny's here. Hello. Um, and um, Natalie is here. Natalie, good morning from PE. Uh, where was I? Uh, I know your plants are missing you. That's okay. I brought them all back. I brought them all with me. So, you know, not the whole garden, but I bought as many plants that we could. Um, we nearly didn't have space for his old in the car, but that's another story. Uh, uh, Marlene, good morning from Bothers Hill. Jenny, um, got succulents indoors and a delicious monster. <laughs> uh, Diane, good morning. You killed a few, but yes, it's a learning process. Absolutely. Please talk about orchids. Uh, the awkward orchid. The phalaenopsis, phalaenopsis, or the moth orchid. Yes, we will. I promise you we'll talk about that today. Um, Ati, um, Sophia, good morning. Wayne, good morning from Pretoria. Got a number of houseplants. The more the merrier. Give them names. Make them feel part of the family. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, Gabby, I didn't know we should keep counting. <laughs> no, man, no, don't count. Don't count the ones that you've got. Stick to the positive. <laughs> Um, let's see who else is here this morning. Oh my goodness. Tanya's here. Is that a peperomia on your right? Yes, this is a peperomia. Oh, aren't they lovely? Aren't they lovely? Come in and look at this one, Mace. Uh, peperomias are beautiful. Um, they also, it's, it's a plant that's been around forever, forever. Um, and some people actually call them the pancake plant because there's another peperomia that has a, a, a slightly bigger leaf. But Peperomias, as you know, if you've watched one of our previous seasons of The Gardener, that peperomias are edible. So if the dog eats them or if the cat eats them, or if you feed it to your husband. <laughs> no, 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 don't, don't. Um, nothing will happen. Absolutely nothing. But yeah, this is a peperomia. I love them. Their textures, uh, they look gnarly, almost like bark. Um, really characterful, especially... And I know it's, it's kind of, I always say, yes, look at the underside, but look at the underside of the leaves because there is texture, there's colours that you might not appreciate if you're just in a glance and kind of just wishing by. Okay. Um, Sonia, what can I do to make my orchids bloom? We're going to get to that. Um, Kim is there. Tess is there. Good morning. Sure, this thing is flashing so much. This looks like I'm in a sci-fi movie. Um, uh, who else is here? Geraldine is here. Um, Zaino, is that how I say your name? Zaino? Yes, Zaino from Cape Town. Anne um, is here. 
who else? I saw Kay is here. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't read that one. Um, <laughs> Catherine's here. Vivian is here. Adele is here. Lynette Bennett is here. What house plants are safe for cats? I read that just now. Well, let's not. Okay, I'm not going to go on on that on erring on that side. But if your cat eats a plant and you know the name, Google it. All right. Vets these days are so adept and they are very, very well versed at how to deal with poisons. Generally, you will see that if the thing is tasting revolting or it's got some acids in it, which might actually cause the animal to drool, you will react immediately. Don't wait. Do not wait. Um, the bottom line is why is the cat eating the house plant? Is what I want to know. And uh, I heard a story this weekend, um, actually yesterday, about a, a little kitten that ate a bromeliad. I mean, it ate the bromeliad with thorns on the edge. That cat needs stimulation or it needs a good talking to, like kitty cut. No bromeliad for you. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, a lot of the times it's purely attention seeking and it's too much energy. And who's it in? It's in the youngsters. It's in the teenage delinquents, um, especially when your fur kids, uh, your feline kids are between one and three. Boy, that is like having an unruly teenager in the household. Um, so uh, that's my advice to you on, on and I'm not going to talk about poisons and that you see so much. I mean, the poor dumb cane plant, the Diefenbachia, was basically slaughtered by social media. Slaughtered. Um, the dumb cane, uh, Diefenbachia, if you have to put in poisonous plants, it'll probably come up first on your Google feed. And, and you can't even buy that plant anymore. And let me tell you, you have to eat about probably half a kg of the stalk before you start having any reaction. Now, if you personally want to eat half a kg of that, well, then good luck to you. You deserve to have a sore tummy. Um, but, uh, you know, so many plants have actually been... I kind of killed before they even had a moment to shine. Um, a lot of things are poisonous. If you have to drink 24 beers, and I'm talking about big guys, 24 beers, even the little guys, the dumpies, if you have to drink 24 of those in one sitting, I'm sure you're going to feel ill. If you have to have one liter of cream, I'm sure you're going to feel ill. It's kind of common sense, guys. It's like, don't, 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 don't go back. Don't go back to the cheese sauce, Tanya. Don't go back. I know you love it on the schnitzel, but don't go back. Stand back. Um, and it's like everything, it, everything in moderation. Sometimes when it tastes too good, maybe it's not so good. Okay. Elka's here. Good morning. Wendy, good morning. Um, and who else is here? Uh, Diane, oh, Diane loves the variegated, oh, isn't she beautiful, isn't she beautiful, come and look in here, <gasps> this is like, this is prized possession, guys, this is, this is, uh, yeah, I think it had the whole back seat just to itself, um, it's stuck up with some doggy pillows, um, so it wouldn't fall over in the car, uh, but an absolute sexy beast, stunning, 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 and, uh, for me at the moment, variegation is like my pop word. Say variegation and I'll drop everything and disappear into the distance. And I'm there looking for that plant. I am there. I mean, it has to have a spot of white on it. And I'm like, got to have it, got to have it, got to have it. It's like the zombies take over and I, and I just have to have it. But that's the way it goes because we are addicted, addicted to plants. Okay, guys, you know what's coming up next. Um, it's the dirty spade. Okay, um, and uh, today we've got some really, really, really cool um, entrance. Uh, it was a very hard decision. Come on, guys, you're making it really hard, but thank you so much for sending in your videos. I love it. We had videos this week, videos, 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 so we could hear you, see you, um, even check out the fur kids in the garden. So, guys, without further ado, here is, and I asked for a drum roll, and it's going to come, the <laughs> Oh, 
Alrighty, folks. So I said it was hard. It really was hard. Um, but, but, um, our runner-up for this week, our first runner-up, uh, goes to. Da -da -da -da. Did we have the drum roll? Um, I just wanted to showcase what my son and I have been doing. Um, we've opened up a space at the bottom of our garden, took down a large ficus tree, um, yeah, made some steps and planted these lovely veggie boxes, which we filled with half compost and half potting soil. Here's the ficus tree that came down. So we've just planted some barleria hedging and some grasses and a speck worm hedge. And here's my compost bin. I think if you can see the before pictures, we've just got our boxes going with some veggies. Here's my furry friend, Winston. Hello, Winston. And that's what we've been up to. So hopefully you'll give us a look. Thanks, Tanya. Take care. Well done. Well done, Catherine. Ah, uh, well, Winston is an absolute hit. But besides that, your raised veggie planters are fantastic. Half compost, half potting soil, so on point. Um, veggie garden looking amazing. And the fact that you, when you took out that big tree, um, and I know there's a whole thing about should we take the trees out, shouldn't we? But if it's not working for your space, guys, if it's not letting the light in, think about various alternatives. Can you thin it out? Could you just remove some of the branches? But there, in the case of your case in point, Catherine, you did absolutely the right thing by taking it out, opening up your garden space and having so much space to work in. Love it. Well done. And keep up the good work. And give Winston a, mwah, a big smooch. Big smooch. And those ears, like you could... Like you could wrap them around you. Too cute, too cute. All right. Our next runner-up, guys, goes to... Ah, there it is. <laughs> Sahira Sadek, well done, Sahira. It is a beautiful video that you sent through. I'm not going to talk more about it. I want to show you what it is. And uh, guys, you're going to love this. This is my happy place. There's nothing that makes me happier after a heavy rain to suddenly see these blossoms. Adding a little flowers in there for some bees. Today we're prepping my soil to plant some seeds using Bio Ocean, highly recommended by Tanya Fissa. So we're gonna give that a try and bone meal of course. Nothing fancy, still getting there. So here, a good job. Absolutely brilliant job. Um, and uh, I've got to read and share this little part of the message with you. And she says, I hope I win this week's competition. Ah, you were so close, but you've got to keep on entering then. Please, please do. Um, and, her, and your husband says that it's a very costly <laughs> hobby. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, but well, well done. Everything grown from seeds. Um, you're using the right stuff. I love the fact that I saw Bio Ocean there. I love the fact that I saw Bone Meal. You're doing it on cue, on cue. And I'm sorry to hear about your cucumber. Um, I saw this morning that your cucumber decided to go to the compost heap in the sky. Uh, that's called heaven for plants. Um, but uh, remember, cucumbers are, are, are quite tricky. Cucumbers are. They succumb to powdery mildew. Um, downy mildew, you've got to be quite gentle with them, especially in their transplant phase or when they have just germinated and when they get to that point. Literally from there to 20 centimeters is a really difficult, almost tenuous time with the cucumber. So, but, uh, but stick with it. Keep what you're doing because you're doing it right and you're doing it with a great intention. So good, good job. But our winner for this week is... Don't you love that? Okay, guys, I want you to watch the video, um, but uh, here it comes. And here is our dirty spade session. 
my daughter planting our gutters with some lettuce and some violas and pansies. We have already done the side against our wall that will get lots of sun during the day and we have mulched as you can see. <laughs> we got our mix there of potting soil, organic pellets and bone meal and we are planting away there. We have planted the lettuce and violas and we have mulched using leaves from our garden. Elizabeth, 10 out of 10, the mulching, the leaves. You tell me that in the winter you use all those leaves and you're going to try our recipe this, this winter, which is great. It's the leaves and, um, and the grass clippings. Remember, a, bit, a few bits of newspaper if you can. Dampen it a little bit and then put it away and make sure that you put a do not remove or do not touch sticker on it. Very, very important, but really nicely done. I love the gutters. It's a great way to do vertical gardening in an easy, uncomplicated way. You know, sometimes vertical gardening can get, Ooh. you know, like I say, we can barely garden on the ground. Now everybody wants us to go up. Uh, so uh, good job, very nicely done. And to you, a 650 Rand gift voucher for my online store, tanyafisa.com. Go and enjoy it and shop till your fingers on the keypad drop. Um, right guys, let's get into it. We're talking unhappy houseplants. Yo, okay, so Kim, Kim Kellerman loves the drum roll. Thank you. <laughs> okay, guys, so many, many, many times we buy a plant, it looks like this. Beautiful anthurium, looking gorgeous, lots of flowers, glossy leaves, and about four months later, it ends up looking like that. Oh, yeah, true story. Okay, exhibit A. We buy a beautiful Phalaenopsis orchid. Looks like this, looking fantastic. And um, this one I'll give about six months, ends up looking like that. Mason, get a real close up on this because a lot of you are going to identify with this miserable poor specimen here that I hate to even admit came somewhere from my garden. Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> but this is what ends up. This is what goes wrong, guys. Um, and how can we stop it? What goes wrong? And how do we fix it? Okay, next thing that we might end up with um, is, uh, do we ha have another half dead? Um, no, we don't have another half dead, but you end up, maybe you've got a ficus, a fig, like this. Beautiful Fred, Fred the ficus up here. Gorgeous plant, you forget to water it for maybe three weeks and um, you try and move it. And when you move it, its leaves just go, whew, it just sheds. You hear them falling, they fall off. So there are two things that go wrong. And generally it is only two things with house plants, guys and they are the following. It's too much or too little water, too much or too little. How are we gonna work that one out? I'm gonna explain it to you. And the second thing is light. That's it, that, that is the beginning and end. Okay, the beginning and end of it. In between there are a few little things we gotta remember, but that is it. Okay, don't overcomplicate it. Now, Remembering that a beautiful anthurium like this, exhibit A, has been grown in a greenhouse. This is a tropical plant. Always ask yourself from whence it came. So anthuriums come from the South Americas. Um, they found in all the tropical countries. In fact, in tropical countries, they grow them as a street plant, for goodness sake. Literally, in beds, um, under the shade of trees. Under the shade of trees. What did you just say? Ah, under the shade of trees. So the worst thing you can do, and the worst thing, rule number one, that we do, some of us do it, I've seen it happen. Um, so it was raining last night, um, beautiful gentle drizzle. I thought, great opportunity to take my plants out for a bit of nice 
good healthy rain. So out you go with all your house plants, put them out onto the stoop, watch them getting watered, um, but then it's bedtime and you forget and you go to sleep. The sun rises the following morning. <laughs> it's like um, it's like when the overseas guests used to come to our beaches. You know, they're kind of like white, like geckos, like see-through. They, they really needed some vitamin D and then they go to the beach and then they get burnt, like, like burnt. In fact, you can spot them a mile away because they got a farmer tan like me. Check my farmer tan. I'm quite proud of my farmer tan, actually. <laughs> but they get burnt to red, tomato, tomato. And that's what you do to your plants. You take them, oh, look, no, no, you need some water. Oh, shame, we're going to put you outside because it's raining. And the sun comes out and scorches them to death. I have seen so many plants die that way. Because guys, houseplants generally are plants that we have decided to become houseplants. God never made a houseplant. No, he didn't. He didn't even give them that name. They're known as jungle plants, under canopy plants. All of these plants come from a jungle somewhere in the world, somewhere in the world. Okay, we have just realized that they can cope in low light, not much direct sun, and they'll be happy, which is the same environment as our homes. Others prefer more light and can cope with more light. And we know that by how? Identifying the size of the leaves, the texture on the leaves. So we've spoken a lot about gray plants, um, hairy leaves, things like that as, as identification methods, as little tips to tell you where the plant is going to live. Now, this little guy over here, he's got lots of little indentations, this little peperomia. Um, dark leaves, pretty fleshy, almost, almost succulent-like, all right, almost succulent-like, which tells you immediately this guy can cope with a lot more light, more light. Okay, so this can go in the kitchen where you're getting that beautiful full morning. And remember, morning sun is not the killer. Early morning light is not the killer. Late afternoon sun is the killer. Because when those rays start, as the sun starts setting and they come through our windows, they come through really sharp. You will know if your desk, because we've all got home offices now, and mine sits where the afternoon sun catches me on my back and it is hot, baby. Imagine if you were a plant, they're like, oh, you can't move. You know, it's going to burn, guys. The thing is going to burn. So it's about light, okay? So, Anthurium, lovely plant. Really, really nice plant. Um, and this plant, if you have to look after it, guys, as is, will go on for years and years and years and years. And even that one, this one, that looks half dead, we are going to fix and I'll show you how to fix it very, very simply. Remember, house plants are not meant to live in this pot forever. This pot that you buy it in, okay, this pot here, is simply a receptacle. It's a transport mechanism because nobody's going to go to their garden center and buy a plant like this. Okay, thanks, I'll have one of these and off I go. No, you're not going to, okay? This is the transport mechanism. It's not meant to live in here forever. Yes, for the first six, eight weeks at home, 100%, it'll be very happy because most of them are given a slow-release fertilizer. They've got everything in them to keep them looking gorgeous. But after a while, it's got to get moved on, okay? Much like us after COVID had to buy an extra size jean pant, okay? Yes, <laughs> true story. <laughs> But plants, their roots expand. <laughs> the, 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 the studio is cracking up now. It's like... <laughs> so, 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 guys, this is, this is just part-time. This is part-time abode, okay? And then it's going to move on to something bigger. And we're going to show you how to get the soil mix right as well. So, examples. I'm going to go through them very quickly, just so that I can get you a fay and, and give you some pointers as to where they'll do best and what they are best for. Now, I told you about variegated plants. Yesterday, when we were shopping for today, and I wanted to get a few bits and pieces, oh, cowabunga, look what I found. Look, and I, I was so excited. I was so excited. Now, this is a Sansevieria, also known as, what is it also known as? Come on, let's see who gets it right. Come on. 
Uh, also known as Sensiveria. What's it also known as? Come on, I want to see. I want to see. No, the studio audience is not allowed to participate. Um, that's my tech team in the background. You're not coming. What is it called? What is the common name of Sansevieria? This plant. Get in close. Show them. Come on. I want to see. I want to see. Come on, guys. Tap. It is. Yes, Diane. Diane, you need a prize. Diane. Foster's fingers to the buzzer. Uh, Mother-in-law's tongue, Diane. I think we're giving you a voucher. Good job. Mother-in-law's tongue. What a terrible name. I must actually try and find out how on earth. We must go and Google. Um, where on earth is this name came from? But this is a new variegated. Its name is Golden Futura. Um, I'm not really too interested in that. All I'm really interested in, and I was like a zombie yesterday, like, and it was really hard to only buy one. Um, it was really hard. Um, but at 120 rond, I chose one. It's a beautiful plant. Now, Sansevierias. Guys, this plant, you can take it out here. And I'm being 100% honest with you because I know I have got one in my potting shed that is currently lying like this and I know it's really bad and I should have planted it up months ago. But it has been lying like that in a bowl, in a tray, which, and I haven't had a chance to plant it up for over six months. And that plant is still alive. It is still alive. Every now and again when I'm watering, I just swish over it. So this is as tough as nails you can do anything to it you can naughty naughty plant you can talk to it badly you can abuse it you can do whatever you want to do to it and it will live so if you're a beginner if you're one of those killers then go for sansevieria they come in so many different varieties now which is why i've become a bit of a sansevieria like um holic yes um because they are Oh, look at all the mother-in-law's tongues coming in now. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Jill Buzzard got it. Is that Jill Buzzard as in Jill from... Jill, is that you as in from Amzinto? If it is Jill Buzzard from Amzinto, I want to know. Um, Audrey got it. Mandy got it. Zenoe got it. Um, Rieta Marie van der Valt got it. Angela got it. Um, Kyle got it. Um, um, Viz Govender got it. Um, <laughs> it's okay, you're here, Viz, even though you joined us a bit late. Uh, good job, good job. Pauline also got it. Uh, okay, so with the mother-in-law's tongue, guys, you get beautiful silver ones, you get dwarf little compact ones. They're, um, they're lovely copper leaf varieties on the market at the moment. So really, um, there's, a, there's tall varieties, shorter ones, just for the right space in your home. Low light, almost no light. And in fact, they can also cope with air conditioning. Now, there are very few plants that can actually cope in air conditioning, but these do, okay? So, Sansevieria. Got to have it. Got to have it. They are buttes. They are absolute buttes. Okay. Um, we've spoken about the Peperomia. Come with me over here. I want to show you here. So, we've spoken about Fred, um, Ficus, many, many different um, uh, variations, forms, a huge, huge family. The thing with, um, with Ficus, guys, is they are really tough. Even if, like I say, you forget to water them for two weeks and you shake them and all the leaves fall off, they will come back. Um, the general killer with this is overwatering. Okay, overwatering, and we're going to touch on that now. Beautiful calatheas. Calatheas, um, folks, are, are spectacular. Once again, um, can cope in quite low light. Low light um, to high light areas. Look at the beautiful undersides. And in fact, calathea leaves move the entire day with where the light is and there's um, a video online and it's on our YouTube channel actually go to Garden Tube and you can see how the calathea leaves move and they caught this in slow motion absolutely spectacular uh, we've had this one plant this very very plant probably for over two years in this pot I'd know it's desperate, desperate for a transplant because if I have to do this and open it up, I'm going to see, yeah, lots of roots, lots and lots of roots. It is really desperate for a transplant, um, which we will show you just now. So I was very bad about this. Um, um, so what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, mother-in-law's tongue. Here's the, oh, I was wondering what on earth this note has been put up for me. Um, so why was it called a mother-in-law's tongue? Because the leaves, oh, wait, wait for it, guys. Because the leaves are sharp, 
pointed, severe, like if they feel their son or daughter being slighted by the spouse. <laughs> that must have come from the 1900s or the 1800s. Pointed. Oh, all right. Okay, right. Next up. Um, and we, we'll talk about this little guy over here. This is a little philodendron. He's called, let me bring him right up here. He's called Birkia. Now, very interesting. Birkin. Now, this philodendron, you get many different types as well. Big, big guys, short little varieties. Now, you'll see we've got it growing in water. Leaves in water. This has become a real big trend. A really big trend. Everybody wants to grow their, 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 um, their plants just in water. And you can do it very successfully with philodendrons. So this is just normal tap water in here. Guys, my recommendation is every two weeks, you want to empty the water out, put new water in. And you want to take this baby. You want to use this. You want to use some Calpac because this is a seaweed concentrate. Okay, it's also a plant growth regulator and stimulant. Okay, so what I want you to do is you mix this in. How do you mix it in? Oh, look, the cap has got the measurements on it. So you just measure it into the cap here. Pop it into um, a trug like this. Pop it into a trug and put the plant into the trug and leave it there for about an hour. Because that's where it gets its nutrition. Okay, because there's no soil to hold the nutrition anymore. So whilst it's in here, it's getting its little hair, getting its conditioner, getting its blow wave, and then it can come back into your fresh water and your philodendron can last for years just like this. And it's quite funky and very much in vogue at the moment. So go and give it a try. Um, remember, you've got to rinse off all the soil off the roots and you do that gently. You're not pulling the roots off, you're doing it nice and gently. Okay, come along here. Oh, look at this baby. Look at this. This is a beautiful um, Ashnanthus. Um, terrible name, Ashnanthus. Um, but its common name is the lipstick plant. And you'll see here, because it's got, there, out comes the flower um, off its bottom spade there. Um, it's not really for its flowers, guys. This is more for its foliage. Um, almost looks a bit like a Hoya. Uh, but really tough, easy to grow, low light, high light conditions, both. How do we know that? Well, because it's got a small leaf, right? Small leaf, quite thick, okay, quite thick. Much, so thinking about the sense of area, can do in high light or in low light areas. Okay, up here, now this is a plant that most people know called the Photos plant. The Photos plant, it's also a member of the Arum lily family, but you cannot kill this plant. I promise you, you can't. You can buy them at your local garden centre in hanging baskets um, or in single little pots. You can transplant them, put them into a basket. They really are tough and they can't do it. You, you can't kill it. You really can't. Uh, high light, low light as well. Um, and then here we've got, oh, caramba. You know the thing that everybody wants is a cocodama. Ah, look at it. Moss ball, hanging moss ball. And um, this was one that we made at home. Uh, this is a beautiful Hoya in here. Hoyas are uh, part of a genus of about 250 to 500 different species of plants that become highly collectible items. Highly, highly collectible. Here's the thing. Patience is required, my friends. Patience. Because if you want your Hoya to flower, you have to keep it alive for five to seven years. <coughs> Really? Yes, yes. Five to seven years before it flowers. But when it does flower, oh, caramba, it is so beautiful. Little star-shaped, waxy bunches of flowers that uh, really are like almost, almost just falling stars. Uh, very, very beautiful. Almost look artificial, um, like that beautiful stuff that you get on a, on a Christmas cake, marzipan, yum, marzipan. They, they've got that texture. Um, but absolutely spectacular. This is a cocodama. Remember, how do you water a cocodama? You take it and you dunk it into a trug that's got the plant food in it. You do that once a week. Okay? You'll know when it needs water because it feels lighter. Okay? And if the leaves aren't curling up and like falling off, then you know it's really, really thirsty. But generally, once a week, dunk it. And what we do at home is we've got a whole lot of them in the bathroom, fill the bath up. 
uh, about that much with water, throw in the plant food, absolutely, mix it up, dunk the plants in there, and uh, Bob's your uncle, and we're good to go. Okay, let's get you back up there, my darling. Right, come, 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 come. Okay, alrighty. Um, oh, come on, I've got to hang you up. Oh, how does this thing work? Okay, there we go, there we go. Hang it back up. Right, okay, we've got a peace lily over here. Now, peace lilies, I know there's a big story about how to get them to flower, but I'm going to help you with that in a couple of minutes. Okay, so let's get on to why they die. Guys, they die because you're overwatering them. The biggest mistake happens like this. This is a little peperomia, as we know, and it's in a beautiful little pot cover. Remember, pot covers don't have holes. See, they don't have holes because we don't want to water them and then they're going all over the beautiful coffee table that we just bought. No, always make sure, please. Do you see this at the end here? Do you see this? We put these on all of our little um, pot holders that we buy because if you've got, and you buy them at your local hardware store, they these little foam, like little rubber feet. Um, and you know, for like people that don't pick up their chair when they leave the dining room table, you know, when they go <laughs> over the tiles, um, so you put those rubber things also on your pots because what often happens is you pull the pot like this, it can scrape, it can damage your table. So they don't have holes because they're for the prettiness. We change them as like we change our cushions in our lounge annually. Trust me, we've got a whole cupboard full of pots that are not in, okay? Because grey is not the colour of the year or something. Do you notice that's not my department? Yes, anyway, anyway, so this is how we go when we water it. We've got it over there, we're in too much of a hurry because we're watering our plants once every, the golden rule, seven to ten days. That is how often you are watering, once every seven to ten days. How do you know when the plant needs water? It's a very simple test. You take your finger, you stick it into the soil, okay, scratch around a bit, you pull it out. Look, no soil on my finger, no soil. You can see it's dry, look here. You can see that the soil is dry, right there. You can see it's dry, okay? If, however, I did this, put my finger in, it came out. Do you see that? There it is. The soil is on the finger. You don't need to water it. That is your simplest, simplest way of telling if a plant needs water or not. Let me clean my finger and I'm going to show you to this poor anthurium that looks like it's on its way to heaven, um, which we're going to stop. Put my finger in there, scratch around, pull it out. Nothing. Okay. So there's your test. Once every seven, ten, seven to ten days and don't forget. Okay. Right. So this is how we water it. We put it there. We've got it there. And there's our little peperomia. And we're going to water. Oh, and we're talking to our plants. And oh, peppy peperomia. Oh, you're looking beautiful, darling. Beautiful. And you're going to grow nicely for mommy, huh? Mm. And we water it and we think our job is done. However, this is where it all goes pear-shaped, as they say in the classics. You pull it out, where's all the water? The water's stuck at the bottom of your little pot holder, okay? Which means that your root system is going to be living in here. I have come into houses and been into homes where you pick this thing up and it goes slosh, 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 and you pull it up and the water is still pouring out. Do you see that? Okay, not a good idea. So how do you water your plants? guys? Take them out of your pot holder, pop them in your sink, put them in your bath, and give them a water. Leave them there. Go out, go and do something. Go and have a cup of tea. Go shopping, whatever you need to do. Wait for them to drain through, drain through. No more dripping, no more dripping. Make sure we get rid of this excess water because we don't want that, and you put it back in its place. Nice and easy. That is how you water a plant. You do not water your plant every third day, every second day, because you are going to kill it. Remember, inside, unless, unless it is near a draft, unless it's near the front door, like in that, that area between the front door and the back door, where there is a lot of light coming in, only then maybe will it be every fifth day. Only then maybe. But overwatering is your one way of killing it. Why? Because the roots sit. They sit inside it, okay? And, and then they start rotting. Um, when the roots start rotting, the main structure of your plant is basically finished. So, if you've got any unhappy houseplants, how do we fix and remedy? Okay, so 
this is what I'm going to show you. So let's go quickly. Let's deal with this guy over here. So what's happened to him? Bottom line is he's been underwatered. Yeah. Um, he's been underwatered. He's looking really sad. And you can see um, dead leaves um, drying off over here. Even a flower that didn't make it. Now, an anthurium is a part epiphyte. Okay, so look at that here. Do you see there come its aerial roots? There's its aerial roots starting there. Okay, so these can actually be out the soil, but it's not ideal. It's not ideal. What do they need? They need a good airy soil, a good airy potting mix. And that's your next thing. So we're going to show you very, very quickly what your ideal potting mix is for indoor plants. Use this recipe, stick with it, and you'll be okay. I promise. Okay, so let's get rid of this excess water here. All right, so guys, this is how we do it. Um, very, very simply, I'm using this little um, balcony planter. These are little balcony planter kits, um, and it's from the city gardening range from Gardena. Nice and simple and new, 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 new. They really are cute. They really, really are cute. Okay, so first up, we need some good quality potting soil. That's not potting soil from the plant that died. Ne? You're not saving potting soil from there and scratching a little bit over here. So we're going to use... Pop in our potting soil, all right, that you get from your local garden center, guys. And because I'm only doing this anthurium, I'm probably only going to be putting about 500 mils. That's about half a liter of potting soil inside here. Right, we move that aside. Next up, you need, and you need this, guys, because indoor plants, remember, when they come from the jungle, they either grow in the trees or they grow at the base. In the jungle, what, what do you think about? What do you think about? Soft, squishy. Okay, lots of leaves falling. That squishiness is the aeration in the soil. It's built up of layers of layers of leaves and air and rotting material, which means it's air. Okay, so to help with drainage, we add in something called perlite. Now, perlite is a mined product. Um, it's, a, it's a volcanic product. It's a byproduct of mining. It works incredibly well. It's very lightweight. It almost has the texture of a pumice stone. Um, that you use on your feet. It's almost like that, but it's used brilliantly to help aeration. So in here, I'm going to use just two handfuls, more than enough, okay? Half a liter of soil, two handfuls of this. And then I'm adding in, which is a counterproductive, you might almost say, but because we want the balance between drainage and moisture holding, I'm going to add in one handful of vermiculite. Now, vermiculite also... Um, volcanic rock product, able to hold moisture. And the final thing I'm adding in is, of course, my palm peat. Because when you buy plants, you will notice. Look in here, guys. There's the perlite. Oh, funny that. Here's the perlite right here. That's what they used. Oh, and look here. There's some palm peat. Okay, so we're recreating that mixture. Okay, so in here, I will put two handfuls of palm peat in, and remember, palm peat starts out in this block, okay, and then you put, put it in here, add some water, and goes, and, it's, and it swells up, and you can use bits as you go. So there's my said plant. All we've got to do now is mix this up really, really well. Okay, so I'll use my little trowel here, and uh, when you mix it, get your consistency really nice. And because, make life simple, guys, use a little trug for a little plant, okay? Okay, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Um, okay, mix this up nicely. Have a look. This is your consistency. Have a look there. You see that? So you've got, you've got a little bit of perlite. You've got a little bit of the vermiculite to help with your moisture. You've got some palm peat in there as well, which is going to help with your moisture holding capacity. And then you've got your bark. Okay, brilliant. What we need. Now, let us sort out this plant. So we've got said anthurium here. Now, what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to be quite vicious with this plant. But I want you to be calm and take a deep breath. And if you really get upset, then pop another pill. Okay? But um, this is how it works. So with an anthurium in this plant, I can very easily get two plants out of it. I could take the whole plant and I could plant it and bury it up to there. Okay? Do you see that? Because they're the aerial roots. This is going to get longer and taller and taller. So what I would rather do is I'd rather take this little guy off and make a new baby and keep this as my main plant.
because then I can still put it into the same pot because I'm reducing it by half now. Okay, so I can make more, make babies. All right, so what we're going to do is first we are going to just shake off a little bit of the soil, not all of the soil. Guys, if you shake off all the soil and you have its roots hanging there, it's like, hold on, I'm hanging on to my drawers. You know, you, you, you really, you're going to upset the plant. You, you're going to put it into such shock and trauma that it's going to really battle to come back. As it is, you've taken it out and you've said, hi, caramba. So, you know, it, don't take off all the, all the roots. Please don't. Um, but what we're going to do here and watch this, because this is one of the tricks with anthuriums, is we are simply just going to cut there. We're going to cut there. Okay, we're going to cut there and there. And we pull this little guy out. Okay. So all I did was snipped away some of the aerial roots. Okay. Snipped them away. And here are all my main roots. Look at that. This oh, you can already see. Doesn't it look bad already? Oh, yes. Of course it does. Now we've got all these long roots. What do we do? Do we fold them around the plant like this to get into the pot? No. What I'm going to do is unfold them. <laughs> And I'm going to give them a light pruning because when you give roots a light pruning, you're going to encourage more roots from the top. Okay, nice and easy. So we've got the original pot that I had, which is nice and simple. Pop in some of your medium. Now, guys, please pay attention at this point. If you are going to be using plain potting soil, which I certainly hope you don't, if you're using plain potting soil and you haven't added any of this into any of the extra binding materials, if you do not put pebbles at the bottom and you pick it up, what's going to happen? See how it runs, cerebral salt. It's going to run out the bottom, okay? Um, so please don't do that. Um, if you've used a mixture like this, then there's no need to put the drainage at the bottom. We're going to fill it up just over halfway. We're going to pop our little baby in, make sure it's in the middle, gently ease our roots down, and then we are going to fill it back. As you're filling, firm it down on the edges. As you're filling, firm it down on the edges, okay? Make sure it's in the center, Mr. Fenter. Okay, there we go. In it goes. Oh, it's looking happy already. Man, you're looking good, baby. Okay, right, when you've finished, just give it a bit of a, a knock like that. You give it a bit of a knock, it settles the soil, it brings it level, and you are good. Now, I've just noticed something. A, the plant looks a bit unbalanced. Okay, can you see that? It looks a bit unbalanced. It's got this leaf going off here. The older leaves are generally at the bottom, which means that this leaf is going to be start dying, all right, very, very soon. I've got this flower that is on its way out. All it's doing right now, because this is where the seeds form, all it's doing right now is putting all its energy into hopefully making seed. We're not interested in that. Take that off, okay? All the energy is now going to go into the leaves and the new leaves that we wanted to form. This leaf over here, because it's unbalanced, it's one of the older ones, I'm going to remove it. But with anthuriums, you have the ability to just take it like that and snap it because it breaks off nice and easily. Okay. <gasps> but what I've just seen, because this plant was under stress, because it was under stress, because it was probably put in the wrong light conditions, it is full of mealybug. Now, mealybug is one of the top, 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 common diseases, insect or insect infestations that happen on indoor plants. Now, take a look in here, Mace, you're gonna have to get really close. What is mealybug? Mealybug is this like little furry guy. Um, it looks almost like cotton wool, little bits of cotton wool. And if you take your finger, you can actually slide it off. Um, that is mealybug, very, very common. It happens when plants are under stress. Um, if they're getting too much light, too much water, too little water. Um, that is generally when you find it. And it's like what I've spoken about before, when you are feeling down, you are susceptible to colds and flus, exactly the same. So how do we treat it? Guys, there are many ways that you can, what, things that you can use to treat it, but I prefer using this. Um, this product has been on the market for yonks and yonks and yonks. It does mealybug. It'll also do um, aphids. It'll do scale, which we commonly find in plants like ficus. Scale attaches itself to more the hard bark of your indoor plants. So ficus especially, you'll find very, very often will have scale. Um, Garden Gun, guys, um, it's got two active ingredients, very safe. 
um, for indoor uh, plants, very, very safe. Safe for humans and fur friends if you follow the instructions. When you're spraying, obviously spray in a well-ventilated space. Um, guys, don't, it's got an on and off switch here. Um, when you spray, well ventilated, spray the plant, do not spray when it's above 30 degrees, do not spray in the direct sunlight, um, just common sense. But this will get rid of all of those nasties, spray once a week until there are no longer signs of the disease. Mealybug takes a long time to get rid of. It's not only one application, it's a few applications. But most importantly guys, once I have transplanted, once I have done this, the next most important thing is watering. And what I do is I inoculate the plant. And this is for anything that you're doing, please. Anything. I want you to inoculate it and I want you to use Root Pro. Please, guys, those of you who have used this have sent me the emails, have told me the amazing results you've had. Remember, you're using a live fungus that you are inoculating your soil that protects your roots of your plant. Um, it's called trichoderma. It works incredibly well. I've revived so many plants, and especially plants that can just kind of fall over or have a bad day. Um, so what you do is pop one sachet into your trug, dip it in there, leave it in there for about half an hour, let it soak it up really well, take it out, and then pop it into your new spot. All right, this guy over here, we'll treat it exactly the same. I'm not going to go into it. Would I remove any of these roots? Absolutely not. No, I wouldn't. I would just clean it up, clean it up a bit, and then pop it in. But remember, when you bury the plant, I would take it up to there. Do you see where the brown is here? Because there are the start of my new aerial roots. Okay, so that's where I'd go. Right, I hear a lot of people are asking about awkward orchids. Come on, darling, let's do it. Okay, now, orchids... I'm going to take that terrible, terrible Phalaenopsis that really is like on its way out. Um, but we are going to fix it. So, uh, yeah, orchid started looking like this. Now, remember, Phalaenopsis orchids uh, <laughs> come from the jungles of Thailand, of Indonesia. I've got five minutes left. There's absolutely no chance I can do all of this in five minutes. So, uh, sorry, folks. We are going over time. So, if you have an appointment with your boss at 12, say, sorry, I are busy. Okay. I got a runny tummy. I ate a plant. <laughs> okay, so, so Phalaenopsis, guys, um, they, they actually live in trees. That's, that's their normal spot. They live in trees, and the forks are trees. They, they jungle plants. They love humidity, which is we, what we, especially you guys living in the high felt, you don't have. So you're taking a plant and you're expecting it to flower and flower and flower, but you're not having the right conditions. Now, first of all, I want to show you a quick tip. Um, house plants need cleaning. Okay, they do need cleaning. Look at this orchid over here. Now I've got a little paintbrush. Look at that there. Can you see the dust coming off? And what happens is when there's a huge dust buildup is that the, the dust actually closes off the stomata. Okay, the stomata, the breathing parts of the plant. And very, very often, and think about in nature, these guys would get rained on, so it would clean the leaves. But in our homes, we're only watering the plant. That's why once a month, when we're normally watering, we've got one of those little hand like spray things. If you don't have one of those, just use a normal watering can. And you water the leaves as well. Water them. Get all the dust off because that definitely does have a huge effect on the performance of your plant because it can't, it can't breathe properly. Okay? Um, take a soft cloth. Okay. Take a soft cloth. Guys, I buy these in bags at my local builders. They, 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 they're beautiful. They really are soft luppies. And take that, uh, dampen it, make it wet, and then you wipe the leaves. Uh, this happens very often in our household, especially if I'm a bit stressed. I then clean plant leaves. Um, it's very therapeutic. And all I'm doing now, and look at all that already. Look at that dirt. You see that? On my Phalaenopsis. Okay. And this is not a clearasil advert, um, but you know what I mean. So, yes, they look amazing. How can we make sure that they live longer? So let's take a look. When these are, are, are starting to go over, you will see it starting to go over. That some of the petals will, uh, will start falling off. It's very important that at that point you need to step in. You need to step in and step up. Okay, so first of all, what I'd like you to do. Now, let's pretend that this was dying, that it had lost. So there was just a stalk here with flowers. If there's just a stalk, it means it's finished flowering. Yeah, she's clear. 
okay? But how do we get it to flower again? Okay, and this is the trick. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna undo it over here. Now, I use this small secateur. here. It's not a big anvil pruner. It's not an anvil double headed secateur. It's a nice small secateur to use for indoor use. If I only want to open there, do you see that? I can open. If I want to open bigger, I can go there. So in those difficult to get to areas of your indoor plants, use a nice adjustable secateur. Right, so we're gonna pretend that these are all dead, okay? Now don't ooh and ah and cry when I cut this off because I need to show this to you because it's gonna make your orchid flower more, okay, more. Before the stem dries out, folks, before it goes brown, in other words, I want you to do this. Halfway up the stem, go to a bud, go to a growth point. There, can you see it? Okay, are we nice and close there? Mace, can they see it? Right, there it is. So there we go, that's called an internode. The, the area between the nodes, that's a node, internode. At the nodes, that's where the growth happens. All I want you to do is a couple of mils above that, not up there, halfway, a couple of mils above it at a 45 degree angle. Cut, darling, cut it. Okay, when you do that, what's gonna happen now, the growth hormones are gonna go mental. This plant is gonna send all its energy back up here. So, 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 trouble, 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 pee bar, pee bar. And what's gonna happen is, it's going to force more flowers. It's gonna send up another flower stalk for you. Please guys, there was a story in there and a lot of people advised it is to take an ice cube and put an ice cube by your phalaenopsis. That is only done in the east where it is very, very, very hot and very humid. And basically you walk out of the airport and you're in a puddle of your own sweat. Um, here in our country, we are not as hot. The ice cube was used, in fact, to lower the ambient temperature around to give optimal conditions. The way that you water an orchid is exactly the same way that you will water your house plants once every five to seven days. If your orchid is in flower and you want it to continue flowering, you use flowering orchids food. That's very easy. Flowering orchids food. And you follow the instructions. It's one little guy inside here. There's a little scoop into five liters of water. Follow the instructions and it works. And when it's not in flower, you use growing orchids. Nice and easy, guys. Okay, and the best way to water them Make your mixture into a trug, take your orchid, pop it in there because mainly it's bark and you want the bark to be able to absorb as much moisture as possible. Leave it there for an hour or two and then take it out. Okay, so that is on the basic care. Now, let's get to that really, really sad specimen. Where did I put it? Oh, shame, she's so ugly. She's so, so ugly. Okay, we're just going to keep you there because you're actually very, very pretty. Um, okay. <sighs> Is it even savable? Of course it is. Okay, now a lot of you would be tempted immediately because this has been eaten by something to cut off these leaves. Don't guys, don't cut off the leaves because what you're doing is you're removing the part of the plant that is able to make food. You're removing the chlorophyll, you're gonna put it under more stress. So first of all, it was attempted to be planted in some orchid bark here. We've got the little stalk left, never throw these things away. Never, ever, ever. I've got a little bucky in my potting shed that I keep these all in. Um, and these little plastic goodies as well. Keep them, keep them, keep them. Okay, so what has gone on here? This plant actually is trying to show some kind of life. Um, but what we first want to do is remove away the dead stalk. There we go. Okay, let's take a look at the roots. Now, remember I told you that they're epiphytic. So these are the older roots. The older roots have the sheath around them and they generally darker gray in color. The new roots, in here, have a look in here. Can you see that white? The new roots are white. There's your healthy root pushing through, which is a good sign. This guy can make it. He really can make it, just with a bit of TLC. Okay, so what we're gonna do over here is we are gonna take away some of the much older, older roots, but not too much. Okay, so some of these that are looking really old and tired. Take a few of those away. And some of them have even, even rotted. Can you see that? Get rid of it because where there's rot, there's fungal disease and that's not what we want. This one is flattened and it's actually quite gooey. Take that off as well. All right, now that's it. I'm not gonna take off any more. Do not take away more anchoring than you need to. All this plant needs now is some of our orchid bark planting soil. Now what is that? What is that? Guys, 
when you pop along to your local garden center, you'll ask them for some orchid bark. They will give you a bag like this, okay? They will give you a bag like this. What you need to ask them, the very, very important question you need to ask them, has this been soaked? Has it been soaked and leached? If your orchid bark is dry, how do you know it's dry? You can see it's a different color, all right? This is wet orchid bark. If it is dry, do not use it as is. You need to take your orchid bark and you need to put it in a trug and leave it there for at least 48 hours. When you put it in there, the tannins will pull out of the bark. The bark will then suck up as much moisture as it can. You get rid of that water because the tannins can actually kill your orchid. And because your bark is dry, it actually removes more moisture from your plant because the plant roots actually have more moisture. Okay, so very important, such an important step in, in planting up your orchids, guys, especially your Phalaenopsis. So, right here, I've got my orchid bark. I'm going to take a little pot. Now, there it is. Um, oh, and I'm going to touch on these things just now. Okay, there it is over there. All I do is pop a bit of my bark in here. Really simple, guys. Take my little guy, put him in there. Now, you see, I'm going to hold him, okay? I'm going to hold him here. Where I want the surface, the, the, my bark level to be is just just where my roots start emerging from the base of the plant. Just there. You can have it a bit higher, it's fine, because these are epiphytes. The roots actually are not used. The roots are merely just an anchor, okay? And then they, that's where they start feeding. They can be buried, they can be up high, all right? So that's not really, but you want to get them to preferably that height because it also looks better. Now, take some of your bark, holding the plant, and then you gently feed it in. As you're feeding it in, turn it. Feed it in little bits. Give it a, a bit of a bang because it's now going in between the roots. Okay? Keeping your plant center. Take a bit more. Feed it in. And you can see how it's busy nicely falling in between the roots there. Okay, we can even speed this up a bit. There we go. Make a nice mess. Give it a bit of a bang. Okay. And there we have one times newly planted Phalaenopsis orchid. And doesn't she even look better? Hi, caramba. Shame. Muriel, you'll be okay, baby. You'll be fine. Just stick with me. You'll be fine. Okay. Then what we're going to do is we're, of course, going to give it some Root Pro. If there were any diseases in here, we're going to inoculate it. Always keep your little stocky handy. You can even pop it inside there for when it does send a flower for you. The other thing I want to quickly touch on is tying plants, guys. We've spoken about diseases. We've spoken about feeding. Um... When tying your plants, and um, Mace, I want you to come across here, please. In fact, no, stay there. I'm going to bring this plant over here. I want to show you how not to do it. Okay. Now, this example is halfway right. This is the stuff I really want you to use. It's called budding tape, guys. And it's a, it's a tape that's used in the horticultural world. And you can pull it and stretch it. So as the plant grows, so it stretches. And it will never cut into the plant. It'll need a bit cut in because remember plants are soft, they've got large cells so it doesn't, they can get easily hurt. This method here, this twisty tie, <coughs> that's called a low growl, um, not nice. Okay, Twisty can also hurt the plants so don't use this wire, plastic coated wire. Although it's readily available, yeah I, I really don't like it. Um, so the stalkers in here got a bit um, but uh, manhandled on the journey here, whenever you are tying a plant, you want to go around, you want to do a figure of eight. Okay, around I go there. Do you see I've crossed it over? I will come back again even if I have to. And then I will put that there. Okay. Around, here, and around. And I'm going to keep it loose because we want the plant to actually be able to move a bit because plants move. And this plant, even if, and here's, here's the fascination of plants, even if I just put the stalk here and left this plant, do you know that the plant will find the stick? It does. The plant will find the stick. All right, let's just prune that off there. Yes, these secateurs are used for this because they're part of the city gardening range. They also recommend that you can use them to actually open up plastic bags of potting soil. So, yeah, don't frown at me. But can you see, we've got a little figure of eight in here. So the plant is not going to rub on there. 
okay, which is nice. The plant's not going to rub on there. It's got space to move still and be able to grow and thicken. Okay, so that's tying up. Okay, guys, feeding of your plants. Feed them, please feed them. Okay, there are many things that you can use. Nutrisol is brilliant. It dilutes. It goes a very, very long way. Um, and when you're feeding, when you're watering, if it, the bottle tells you once every two weeks, then you do that once every two weeks. Nutrisol is good. It's well balanced. Um, it's going to give you the nitrogen, the potassium, the, um, the phosphorus. It's going to give you some iron and molybdenum as well. All right. When you have just transplanted, I also recommend, please, once you have used your start grow, I beg your pardon, once you've used your Root Pro, which is, remember, the Root Pro came in the sachet, and that is any half-sick house plant, one that's looking a bit like, eh, eh, okay? You're going to mix this, okay? Now listen carefully. You're going to mix Root Pro with some Start Grow. Now, Start Grow encourages roots. It doesn't encourage quick growth, which is what we want. We want to get the roots established first. Start Grow does not have nitrogen in it. It's got other important things like calcium and iron which encourage rooting. So I always, when I transplant anything at home, is a mixture of this and a mixture of this, and I dunk it in there, okay? And that gets it going. Once it's going, then I alternate either with my Nutrisol um, or my multi-feed, multi-grow. So guys, that's the way to do it. That is feeding. Follow the instructions on the bottle. Like they say, every diet in the world works, you just have to stick to it. Okay, guys, that's indoor plants. I know that you've got lots of questions, but we are going to get to them um, as soon as we can. But right now, uh, let's get you geared up for the weekend for the upcoming jobs for the weekend. Guys, it's a big gardening weekend ahead. There's lots to do. Um, and if uh, you don't really feel like getting into the garden, but you want to learn more about it, then remember to get your hands on the latest copy of The Garden and Detail Need. We've got a fabulous article here on how to how to decipher the Latin in gardening, whether you're talking Romantica or, or uh, is your Diefenbachia or your Dizzy Gothica Elementissima doing okay, or how's your delicious monster? Um, well, how is your delicious monster, darling? Anyway, 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 remember to get your copy um, of The Garden and Detainee. Guys, Grow to Eat is also out. Um, I thank you for being with me this morning. A big, big shout out to Effecto for their garden gun and a very big shout out to Gardena um, for their city balcony, city gardening range. Uh, they grubber and their trowel. They really work nicely. Um, so go out and get yours now, folks. Thank you, thank you. Long may your house plants live. Um, and God bless you all, and most importantly, happy gardening. Gardening with Tanya was proudly brought to you by Gardena. Realize your gardening dreams. Effecto, target pesky garden pests. And tanyafisser.com for all your gardening goodies and supplies. Calling all green-fingered gurus and plant killers alike. We got you covered every month with gardening inspiration, hands-on practical advice and fun projects to do. From the latest in plant fashion, growing your own, whether to prune or not to prune, from cover to cover, the Gardener and Detainee magazines have got your back. Get your copy now or subscribe online at thegardener.co.za.